Institute for Development Studies, or BIDS, has been the country's foremost socioeconomic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner Seminars And the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Service through policy research. In need of references for your research? Do you want a digital library that you can access for free anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. Serpy is here for you. Serpy is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information, created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SERP, just visit the PIDS website and click the SERP widget, or type serp pidsgovph SERP has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers, policy notes, audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2021, SERPI has more than 50 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. SERPI provides a comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes, labor and education, gender and development, poverty, technology and innovation, trade and industry, and many more. You can search by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published. Therapy has more than 7,000 publications and audiovisual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit Serpy now. Socioeconomic Research Portal for the Philippines, Innovating Knowledge Exchange and Policy Research. Dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahin problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon. We should have a specific goals, um, do research, and make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. Iayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ang batas, pag-aralan muna gusto ng government. Two things, clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies, o PIDS, na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga pulisiya at programa ng pamalaan at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga pulisiya ang makakatulong sa ating bansa. Sinusulong ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policy making upang bigyan din ng kalaghan ng polisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. 
Napakahalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag pulisiya ay pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan! So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs, research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies, service through policy research. So what is PIDS? In need of references for your research? Do you want a digital library that you can access for free anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. Serpy is here for you. Serpy is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information, created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SERP, just visit the PIDS website and click the SERP widget, or type serp-p.pids.gov.ph. SERP has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers, policy notes, audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2021, SERPI has more than 50 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. SERPI provides a comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes. Labor and education, gender and development, poverty, technology and innovation, trade and industry, and many more. You can search by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published. SERPI has more than 7,000 publications and audiovisual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit SERPI now! Socioeconomic Research Portal for the Philippines, Innovating Knowledge Exchange and Policy Research. Dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahing problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon. We should have a specific goals, um, do research, and make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. Iayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ang batas, pag-aralan mo na gusto ng government. Two things, clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication, and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies, o PIDS, na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga pulisiya at programa ng pamalaan 
at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga pulisiyang makakatulong sa ating bansa. Sinusulong ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policy making upang bigyan din ng kalaghan ng pulisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. Napakalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag pulisiya ay pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan! Welcome to the PIDS webinar series. Before we start the webinar, we would like to give you a few reminders. For attendees, your microphone is muted upon entry. In case you have a question, the moderator will read it during the open forum. For those attending via Cisco WebEx, use the chat box located at the lower part of the screen. Click the chat icon, type your name and affiliation, and your question, and send to all panelists. You may send your questions while the presentation is in progress. The moderator will read them during the open forum. For Facebook viewers, at least two questions from the comment section will be read by the moderator during the open forum. We will moderate all questions to ensure that they are relevant to the scope of the presentation. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to your active participation. Good afternoon and welcome to the PIDS webinar series where we feature our policy studies and the insights of development actors and stakeholders. I'm Sheila C.R. and I will be your moderator. Our national experience in battling the COVID-19 pandemic offers a wealth of lessons on addressing a wide-scale health crisis with far-reaching socioeconomic impacts. This afternoon, we are launching the Institute's newest book, that chronicles the Philippines' response to the COVID-19 pandemic and the lessons worth keeping in mind as we navigate our future amid the impacts of COVID-19 and other issues. To officially open our virtual book launch, I now give the floor to Dr. Marife Balias-Peros, Vice President of PIDS. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, I would like to first acknowledge the presence of key officials from the government. We have the Department of Science and Technology Undersecretary, 
Sancho Abora, Department of Education under Secretary Justado San Antonio, and Directors Roger Masapol and Laila Ariola. From the House of Representatives, CPBRD Executive Director Novel Bangsal, Senate Economic Planning Office Executive Director uh, Merwin Salazar, Department of Finance Chief Economist Hill Beltran, Department of Budget and Management Director Yolanda Reyes, Department of Health Director uh, Beverly Lorraine Ho, National Economic and Development Authority Assistant Regional Directors Dolores Molintas and Irene Ubungen. From the academe, we have, we have the following. Southern Luzon State University President Dor Dorasi Zoleta Nantes, Cagayan State University President Urduho Alvarado, University of the Phil Philippines Virata School of Business, Dean Joel Tan Torres. And from the CSO, um, national NGOs and international NGOs, we have the Philippine Nurses Association, National President Melvin Miranda, the Ibon Foundation Executive Director, Sunny Africa. So let me also greet our guests, colleagues from the government, the academe, civil society, media, private sector, and those who are watching through the PIDS and SERPI Facebook uh, pages. I welcome all of you to this webinar event. The year 2020 saw much of the world become paralyzed because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Countries, both developed and developing economies, adopted similar responses that includes a combination of travel restrictions and community lockdowns, mandatory health protocols, economic safeguards and social safety nets to help uh, the micro and small firms as well as vulnerable households tied over the difficult times. We have observed that while the interventions are similar, the magnitudes and delivery mechanisms differed. And from various discussions that we have heard on the effects of responses to the COVID-19 pandemic, what seems to be the case is that while the types of interventions matter, it is the systems, the processes, including the timing of interventions that have created difference in impacts among countries. For instance, among ASEAN five economies, the Philippines implemented the harshest set of measures at the height of the pandemic crisis in the region. Vietnam is next to the Philippines in the stringent index, but, pub but public health and economic outcomes were vastly different between the two countries. Vietnam recorded positive GDP growth by the end of the 2020 compared to the negative GD GDP growth for the Philippines in the same year. The Philippines also responded to a nationwide vaccination program, but implementation has been much delayed, resulting in slower economic recovery. Now, as we move to a post-pandemic scenario, it is good to reflect on how we have coped with COVID-19 at the height of the crisis. How did similar responses to the crisis compare with global experiences? What have the Philippines done right and what do we need to improve on? So for this afternoon, I'm proud to share with you the PIDS newest book entitled The Philippines Response to the COVID-19 Pandemic, Learning from Experience and Emerging Stronger to Future Shocks, authored by the PIDS research researchers. This book uh, compiles various papers that assess the strategies, the policies, and recovery efforts of the Philippine government during the first year of the COVID-19 pandemic. Specifically, it discusses the challenges that the country had experienced and analyzed the government's responses in the areas of health, macroeconomy, food security, labor, social protection, poverty, education, digitalization, fiscal response, 
and crisis and risk communication. We are honored to have this afternoon former PIDS president and the book's volume editor, Dr. Celia Reyes, who will provide an overview of the book as well as the findings of her book chapter focusing on the impacts of the pandemic on poverty in the Philippines. We will also hear from selected chapter authors. We have incumbent PIDS President Dr. Aniceto Orbeta Jr., who will focus on the government's pandemic responses in the basic education sector and the uh, on the basic education sector. The PIDS Senior Research Fellow, Valerie Gilbert Ulep on health. We will also be joined by PIDS Senior Research Fellow, Dr. Maria Margarita Gonzalez, who will talk about the pandemic's impact on the Philippine economy and the macro responses of uh, the government. This book is now part of the knowledge support on overcoming a health crisis of the COVID-19 pandemic. Magni I, I mean magnitude. We hope that through this book, the government, the private sector, and the community will make the needed reforms for the country to be better prepared for similar challenges in the future. So I thank our presenters and all our participants and viewers for joining us today. I look forward to a fruitful discussion and your participation in the open forum. Thank you and good afternoon. Thank you very much, Dr. Balisteros. Okay, so to give us an overview of the book and the highlights of the theme chapter, let us listen to the volume editor, Dr. Uh, Celia Reyes, immediate past president of PIDS and the Institute's first uh, female head. She, in, she is an expert in poverty research and has produced numerous studies on poverty and inequality, social protection and development impacts of government programs. She is the brains behind the community-based monitoring system or CBMS, a poverty monitoring tool for local government units, which was institutionalized with the enactment of the CBMS Act in 2019. Mamsel, the floor is now yours. Thank you, Sheila. So good afternoon, good afternoon, everyone. So we're very pleased to be sharing with you this afternoon uh, some of the key findings and lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, allow me to share a little bit about the background um, of this project. We actually started work on this project as early as December 2020. Uh, being one of the most disaster-prone countries, um, in fact, we ranked number eight um, in terms of most affected country by extreme weather events, according to the World Risk Index in, uh, of, as of 2021. Um, I thought it was very important that we do post-disaster assessment. Uh, very seldom do we do um, post-disaster assessment. And so I think this is one of the reasons why um, it seems like we always start from scratch whenever a shock hits us. So I thought that if we do um, document our responses and lessons learned uh, from this pandemic, it would help us learn from our experience and also help us manage future shocks. So I'm very grateful to the fellows who actually contributed to um, this particular initiative. Um, next slide, please. So um, for this afternoon, um, actually we will be um, sharing with you um, uh, about the book, the status and impacts, government policy responses, um, issue and concerns in, in the pandemic response and lessons learned by, by sector. So I'll be providing the overview, but as Dr. Balisteros mentioned earlier for this afternoon, we're actually going to highlight um, some of the sectoral findings specifically on health by Dr. Ulep and um, on education by Dr. Um, or beta, and also um, the macro responses and lessons learned um, by Dr. Um, Maggie Gonzalez. Um, so for this afternoon, I will be focusing on um, the Philippines' response to the COVID-19 pandemic, learning from experience and emerging stronger to future shocks, um, which I co-authored with, um, of course, a very um, excellent uh, researchers, um, Tina Ortiz, Rita Vargas, and Arkin Arboneda. So um, 
in terms of the objectives of the book, um, the book was really intended to um, do the following, examine the observable impacts of the pandemic on various sectors of the Philippine economy and society, document the government's response to the pandemic, identify gaps, issues, and challenges in the government response to the pandemic, and finally provide some recommendations to help decision makers craft and implement better policies. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's really to learn from um, our experience with a shock and hopefully help us manage future shocks uh, better. Um, next. So um, for the theme paper, um, which uh, we will be presenting um, today, um, there are also, um, which as I mentioned earlier, um, was done by our team, um, Tina and Rita are actually here and we're hoping Arkin is also um, uh, watching. Um, we also have several background papers that have been prepared by the different fellows and also our, our current president of PIDS, as well as um, um, Dr. Sheila Shiar, who's actually uh, the head of our RID. Let me just go back to the previous slide. Um, so the first paper that started it all was actually the paper done by Dr. Abrigo and, and colleagues, um, including Dr. Ulep and um, Dr. Francisco and um, and Jana Uy. And that was the projected disease transmission, health system requirements, and macroeconomic impacts. This was done um, as early as April 2020. And, and um, what they did was actually to come up with some projections in terms of what would be the likely impacts of the pandemic, um, not just in terms of health, but also in terms of the, the economy. And in addition to that, um, we actually have um, the other background papers on health by Dr. Ulep. Um, we also have the macro responses by Dr. Gonzalez, which uh, both of them will be presenting today. Um, Findings on food security in the Philippines by Dr. Briones and um, impacts on the Filipino migrant workers by Dr. Tabuga and um, Carlos Caballero. Inequality and human development in the Philippines by Dr. Navarro. Um, we also did um, this paper mitigating the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on poverty. Um, and then the next one is poverty, the middle class and income distribution. Uh, by, by Dr. Albert, Dr. Abrigo, Dr. Kimba, and um, Jana Bismanos. And the paper on education, um, which will be uh, presented this afternoon by Dr. Orbeta. And uh, crisis and risk communication uh, by Dr. Uh, Sheila Siar. And national and local government's fiscal response and role in recovery. Unfortunately, we don't have time to present all of this, so we've selected only um, some of the papers to be presented this afternoon. Next. So let me turn to uh, status and, and impacts. Um, as we all know, um, this has been a very big shock to, to the Philippines. The Philippines placed 24th and 26th with the highest cumulative cases and deaths, respectively, among 236 economies as of June 2021. So as of June 2021, we've had 1.4, about 1.4 million um, total cases and um, about 24,000 deaths. And um, that has actually increased um, so that as of May 24, 2022, we have almost um, 3.6 million cases and um, 60,000 um, deaths. Next. And among ASEAN member states, the Philippines ranked second with highest cases and deaths and biggest economic contraction in 2021. Next. So we actually experienced 9.6 percent contraction in um, 2020. So what was the initial response of the government? Um, as we can see as detailed here in the table, um, actually the government resorted to um, um, uh, monitoring of the Philippine borders, tighter screening of passengers, halting of visa issuance, and restrictions on inbound flights. Um, the interagency task force was also convened for the first time. And in February, flight restrictions were extended to other territories, such as those coming from mainland China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan. And in March, as the first case of local transmission was reported, 
restrictions on quarantines with different levels. Um, I'm sure we're all familiar with this, the ECQ, GCQ, modified GCQ um, were um, actually implemented. And notably, the Philippines has been recognized as one of the countries with the longest and strictest lockdown in 2020. Next, please. Um, however, we find that this um, um, restrictions on the people's mobility coupled with the fear of contracting the virus hampered economic activities, causing businesses to either temporarily or permanently shut down. Um, immediately as a result, unemployment rose and hit a record high of 17.6% in the second quarter of 2020, or 10.4% for the whole year of 2020, um, or 10.3% um, rather. Meanwhile, underemployment rate suddenly reverted to its 2018 level. So the bar chart uh, shows that the industry sector experienced the most reduction in employed persons, largely owing to the decline in the manufacturing subsector. And the services sector actually also reduced by 8.5%, owing to the decrease in employment in accommodation and food service. So those are your hotels and restaurants, um, arts, entertainment and recreation, information and communication, and real estate activities. Next. So in um, by 20, um, by the second quarter of, of 2020, the Philippines entered recession um, with a contraction of 16.9%. So that for the whole year of 2020, real GDP um, contracted by 9.6%. Um, this was the deepest recession in history since post-war. Um, what we experienced in, in 2020. In the second quarter, particularly quarterly GDP growth um, dipped by 16.9%, bringing the annual GDP decline to 9.6% in 2020. So what made our economy highly vulnerable? Our economy is largely reliant on the services sector, and as can be seen, the most gravely hit sectors are under the services, such as the accommodation and food service activities, transportation and storage, which were affected as lockdowns were implemented. Next. On the expenditure side, um, only government spending posted positive growth in 2020, albeit still lower than that of the previous year. Gross capital formation experienced the largest decline, followed by um, household spending. The consumer outlook were also very low in the latter half of 2020, which was mainly attributed to the pandemic, in addition to the seen increase in unemployment, reduced incomes, and faster increase in the prices of goods. Next, please. And in the education sector, schools were compelled to shift to remote learning. So elementary schools are the most affected in terms of enrollment. And overall, there's a 3% decline in school participation in um, basic education. And um, Dr. Um, Orbeta will actually be um, sharing the details about this. Um, next slide. So in the table, we see that the private schools experienced 21.6% um, decline in enrollment or equivalent to about 1% million um, students. So um, it was really the private sector that was, uh, the private school attendance that was most affected by, by the pandemic. Next. And in terms of the major mode of learning, um, we found that um, students were then compelled to rely on other modes of learning um, because of the lockdown. So data showed that majority of the students in public schools relied on printed modules while those in private schools shifted to blended learning. And this is how, somehow reflective of the di digital divide that exists in the country as shown by the FIES 2018 data set. And we see that there's a large um, disproportion in terms of access to computers by um, income decile. Turning to poverty, um, as we would expect, uh, poverty incidence and magnitude um, is expected to worsen due to the pandemic, reversing recent gains in poverty reduction. So um, using the um, actual contraction in GDP in 2020 of 9.6%, the simulated poverty incidents among families um, would actually um, 
increase. Um, this is um, without um, without SAP, without the social assistance um, uh, amelioration program. And so we would see that um, the actual data is for 2018 um, is 12.1%. That's the proportion of uh, poor families um, because of the growth in 20, economic growth in 2019 that was expected to go down further to 10.6, but because of the pandemic, it's expected to go up to 16%. And then because of the um, slight recovery or turnaround in 2020, um, poverty incidents expected to um, improve a little better in, in 2021 to 14%. So this is um, our simulations showing the uh, expected trend in, in poverty. Next. So um, we only have data, actual data for the first semester of um, 2021, and that would actually be shown in the green um, line, um, showing that uh, based on the official data, if the poverty incidence based on the first semester data of 2018 is 21.1%, um, the data for the first semester of 2021 shows that it's just gone up 23.7%. Um, the line at the bottom actually um, shows the actual um, data using full year. So 23.5% in 2015 and 16.7% in 2018. And what we did was actually to uh, append or um, show our um, simulation results. And what we're showing here is that um, by 2019, this is the poverty incidence among population. It would have gone down to 14.8%, but would have gone up to 21.5% by 2020, and then down to 19% by 2021. And this is without the without considering the positive impacts of um, social amelioration program on poverty reduction. And I'll go back to SAP later on. Unfortunately, the data that we have right now actually do not distinguish between chronic and transient poverty. And our previous studies have shown that those who are considered poor at any one point in time um, actually consist of two groups. Those who are chronically poor, meaning consistently poor all throughout, and those who just um, moved into poverty because of some shock. And uh, as we can see, and as we would expect, because of this shock, many families would have, or many individuals or families would have fallen into poverty because of this shock. And unfortunately, we don't have that kind of information. And that's something I think that we need to um, address um, in the near future, coming up with um, more information in terms of um, chronic and transient poverty so that we can actually um, understand better the dynamics of poverty and more importantly, be able to formulate appropriate interventions. Because what we have seen in our previous study is that about half of those who are um, considered poor are chronically poor or consistently poor all throughout, while the other half are just transient poor or those who are uh, who just um, moved into poverty because of some shock. Next, please. So what have been the, the government uh, responses? Next. So um, the, the government has legislated um, two um, important um, um, legislation, pieces of legislation, Bayanihan 1 and Bayanihan 2. Uh, Bayanihan 1 to heal, or Bayanihan to heal as one act um, was enacted in March 2020, granting the president special powers to combat the COVID-19 pandemic. And as of June 2021, the total budget allocated for that was 394.4 billion pesos. And about, um, you know, 96.8 percent has been dispersed as of uh, June 2021. And we can see that most of it has actually been allocated to the SWD and that's actually uh, mostly uh, SAP and among other um, subsidies to, um, to the individuals and, and families. 
In addition, Bayanihan 2, um, or Bayanihan to Recover as One Act, was also enacted, and that was in September 2020, providing for pandemic response and recovery interventions. And the budget allocation for that was 214.1 billion, and uh, about 89% of that has been disbursed as of June 2021. And you can see that um, for this particular um, uh, fund, um, a large part of it went to um, SSS. Next. So what were the emergency measures implemented during the ECQ? Um, and these were anchored on the emergency measures provided under the Bayanihan one. So we have um, different cash assistance programs, including the social amel amelioration program, Rice Farmers Financial Assistance Program. We have the COVID-19 Adjustment Measures Program for OFW and workers in the formal sector implemented by the Department of Labor and Employment. We also have in-kind assistance, um, you know, from OWA, transportation, food, accommodation for our overseas workers, um, agricultural products to LGUs by the Department of Agriculture. We have the free bus ride program for health workers from the Department of Transportation. They bring Sakai program and point-to-point -point bus augmentation scheme. Uh, system from the MMDA and uh, food and non-food items provided by DSWD. In addition, we have the wage subsidy for small businesses um, implemented by the um, DOF. This is under the Small Business Wage Subsidy Program for workers in the formal sector. And there were also grants, loans, assistance programs provided by the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Trade and industry, the latter primarily for medium, um, micro, small, and medium enterprises. We also have the Emergency Employment Program, Tulong Panghanap Buhay sa ating disadvantaged displaced workers, um, Barangay Ko, Buhay Ko Project, uh, which aims to employ displaced um, workers. And um, finally, we also have um, the program of SSS, uh, which provides calamity loans um, of up to 20,000 pesos. Next. Um, so um, we can see that um, actually a lot of programs has been um, have been implemented by the government and uh, to assist low income families, displaced workers, farmers and OFWs, among others who were affected by the pandemic. And this chart just shows um, how much was allocated. Um, target beneficiaries, number of target beneficiaries, as well as the benefits given. And let me just focus on the social amelioration program, um, emergency subsidies program. Um, for this particular one, uh, there were two tranches of assistance given to um, low-income families. Um, and the first tranche uh, covered about 18 million um, families. So you can imagine it's more than half of the um, total number of, of families. And then the second tranche covered a slightly lower number of families, 14 million. And the benefit given was about 5,000 to um, 8,000. Um, I don't have time to discuss all of them, so I let me just go to to the next um, slide um, because this is something that uh, we would like to, to focus on because of the size of the program. So this was uh, the target beneficiaries of SAP um, were primarily poor families registered in the Pantawid Pamilyang Filipino Program or the Four Ps. It was also intended to cover informal economy workers such as the self-employed, small-scale small producers and distributors, and also those belonging to vulnerable sectors such as senior citizens, persons with disability, pregnant and lactating women, solo parents, overseas Filipinos in distress, and indigent indigenous um, peoples. I think you already have a sense that um, while this is, I, I think, very good, you can already imagine the challenge in terms of identifying and locating all of these target beneficiaries. Um, so that's one of the, the major um, challenges in implementing such a, a big program covering um, so many target beneficiaries. And as I mentioned, the financial assistance amounted to 5,000 to 8,000, depending on the regional minimum wage rate where the beneficiary is, is located. Next. So um, what we did was to simulate what would be the impact of this cash transfers from the social amelioration program. And as we can see um, here, if you look at the first few um, uh, rows, um, if 
the poverty incidence is projected to be uh, poverty incidence among families is projected to be 16% without the social amelioration program with the cash transfer from this program it is projected to go down to 12.2% so very significant decline in poverty incidence because of the sheer size of the the amount the cash transfer given as well as the um, large number of beneficiaries covered by by this program and similarly the poverty incidence among population would have gone down from 21.5 percent to 17.3 percent because of the cash transfer next please so there were other government responses so mobility restrictions um, due to localized lockdown, community quarantines. There was also efforts to improve awareness. Uh, so there were a lot of information dissemination campaigns. Um, there were general guidelines issued. So creation of a national action plan, primarily on test, trace, and treat. And there was also health system support, so augmentation of human resources for health and expansion of facilities for treatment and isolation and protection, so including vaccination rollout, among others. Next. So um, let me just share some issues and concerns in the pandemic response. Um, next. So for instance, in communication issues, we find that the communication interventions for COVID-19 response in the Philippines can be characterized as late, incoherent, vague, and, and confusing. And um, the details are actually um, in one of the papers in this volume um, as authored by Dr. Sheila Siar. There's also lack of expanded and targeting testing and aggressive contact tracing. So the country lagged in contact tracing and ramped up testing, which are among the more effective response strategies employed in most in most countries. Also, the country was the government was late in implementing much needed preventive measures at the onset of the health crisis. The implementation of community quarantines became the go-to response whenever there is an impending surge of cases. Unfortunately, lockdowns were complemented with weak contact tracing and testing efforts. Next. Um, there were also um, issues related to data. So having clear, accurate, timely, and granular data is important to identify appropriate response strategies and policies promptly. Unfortunately, serious data issues were evident in um, the Philippines. Data issues were also observed in targeting beneficiaries for the provision of assistance to affected individuals and families, which in turn led to delays in the distribution of aid. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, um, trying to identify and locate 18 million eligible um, families was, was quite a challenge. Um, inadequate consultation with public health professionals and experts led to poorly planned policies that are in contrast with the advice of medical experts. And also there's a lack of a strongly coordinated implementation framework. So vertical and horizontal plans and operations were not fully aligned. So what were some of the lessons learned um, by, by sector? And the reason we're pulled, we're trying to put them all together is because we're hoping that from this, uh, we could probably manage uh, future shocks uh, better. So um, in the area of health and community quarantines, we find that imposing community quarantines or lockdowns is helpful, but not sufficient in suppressing the outbreak. I will let Dr. Ulep um, discuss more um, the other lessons and, and findings in, in the health sector when he does his presentation later today. Next. In the area of education, I, I think um, our experience in terms of different learning modalities um, is going to be um, very useful um, moving forward from, from this pandemic. And again, Dr. Orbeta um, is in a better position to discuss um, the lessons learned in this particular sector. Next. Um, and of course, macroeconomic response is key, um, not just during the pandemic, but in terms of moving forward uh, on our road to, to recovery. And, um, and what we've seen is that monetary easing, public spending, and certain demand substitution helped spur growth in some subsectors. And Dr. Maggie Gonzalez will be presenting us um, the details um, this afternoon as well. Now, um, 
let me just talk a little bit more about some of the other sectors because we don't have uh, the opportunity to hear from the other uh, chapters. Uh, in terms of data, ICT, and digitalization, we find that more granular data are necessary to formulate and implement data-driven responses. Um, the national government directly needs to strengthen digitalization strategies to improve the use and access to ICT. And the government must accelerate investments in ICT infrastructure to prevent the worsening of inequalities in the education sector. And the government plays a significant role in enhancing digitalization in the economy by supporting financial innovations to reach the unbanked and promoting digital payments in public transactions. So this would help a lot in the distribution, particularly of cash transfers. The full implementation of the national ID system as a foundational digital ID system and its linking to the existing social protection information systems is essential in ensuring the efficient and effective execution of crisis-related social assistance programs. But let me point out that um, you know, having the national ID is not adequate to be able to identify and to identify eligible beneficiaries. So you have to link it with existing uh, information systems to better identify eligible beneficiaries. Next. And in terms of social protection, um, uh, social safety nets that are effective, properly targeted, and well distributed are necessary to help Filipino families cope with the damaging effects of the pandemic. Equally important are strong leadership and data-driven decision-making in executing the pandemic response. We also find that modifying existing assistance programs instead of creating new ones with new mechanisms for implementation may be a more efficient approach in crisis response, and this would allow us to respond faster. In line with the imposition of community quarantines, the national government must also ensure that people have access to food and other necessities through massive safety nets programs. And adequate universal health coverage can greatly help in future public emergencies, especially health-related ones. And while emergency cash transfers and formal and food relief packages are needed to smooth consumption, Programs that will assist households to have jobs and restart their business are necessary, especially if we want those who temporarily fell into poverty to be able to recover more quickly and move out of poverty. Emergency subsidies such as monetary assistance, food and non-food items are essential to augment the needs of Filipino families during a pandemic. And again, this is something that's very important. We always want to... Um, be ready with a list of eligible beneficiaries for different programs. So establishing interoperable databases across government agencies is vital in crafting effective and timely policies during public emergencies. And the national ID can actually provide um, that variable to be able to merge the different um, administrative databases. And um, next. And we also have uh, the important role of local government units because the whole of government approach is necessary for implementing the pandemic response. And um, with that, uh, the communication, uh, as I mentioned, something that's very important, there's a need to harmonize messages used at the national and local levels to ensure accuracy and, and consistency. And a very important policies and protocols should be widely disseminated ahead of implementation dates so that everybody um, can adjust to um, new policies and, and protocols. And citizen engagement should be widely uh, promoted and role of public policy information officers should be strengthened. And um, with that, I would like to thank you and I'll turn it over to um, Dr. CR. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mamsel, for that comprehensive presentation. We'll, we will hear more from uh, Dr. Reyes during the open forum. So uh, let's look at some of the chapters uh, featured in the book, uh, beginning with the uh, multifaceted uh, health impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. And let's hear it from Dr. Ulep, a senior research fellow at PIDS. Dr. Ulep directs the Institute's uh, research projects on health and nutrition, and is also a, re a senior researcher at the Ateneo School of Government. If, uh, before joining a PIDS, he worked at the World Bank in Washington and Delhi and was a 
doctoral uh, fellow at the University of Toronto Center for Global Health Research, where he conducted uh, economic studies on tobacco taxes. Val, you now have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. C.R. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, hi, hi there. Hi, everyone. So, uh, first and foremost, I would like to take this opportunity to um, present our our work on the multifaceted impact of the pandemic. Um, I would like to thank um, my PIDS family for mounting this event, especially to Dr. Celia Reyes, uh, our former PIDS president, for leading this very important endeavor. So this study is basically an accumulation of studies that uh, we conducted during the earlier uh, phases of the, of the pandemic. So just a caveat, um, most of the data um, for this presentation were collected during the first year of the pandemic and needs updating. Uh, nonetheless, the findings of this study um, remains very relevant. Um, the study therefore reinforces that we researchers and decision makers need to continue monitor critical health indicators as we transition into uh, the new normal. So as um, mentioned by Dr. Reyes a while ago, the COVID-19 pandemic has caused significant mortality and morbidity, not only in the Philippines, um, but globally, right? Um, typically, um, especially during the earlier stages of the pandemic, we measured the burden of the pandemic using death or COVID death and infection rates. However, these indicators were usually, um, and, and these two indicators were usually the sole basis of pandemic response. However, we argue in this study um, that these numbers barely represent the overall health impact of the pandemic. So during the earlier stages of the pandemic or during the earlier phases of the pandemic, we wanted to explore the unmeasured health impact of the pandemic that were not captured by the, the usual COVID death and infection rates. Therefore, the objective of the, of the papers are, uh, the paper, um, uh, are the following. So number one, we wanted to measure the magnitude of decline of healthcare services during the pandemic. Um, and two, we, want, we also wanted to estimate the cost of both mortality and morbidity due to uh, COVID and non-COVID um, um, illnesses. Next slide, please. Just a little bit of background. Um, during the height of the pandemic, many countries have reported extreme disruption in the healthcare system. Uh, for example, in Africa, they had noticed that uh, significant decline in maternal and child healthcare services. In the US, they experienced around 20 to 40% decline in hospital admissions. Um, in, in India and in Pakistan, for example, they, um, they experienced a huge decline in TB, uh, maternal and child healthcare services, and reproductive health. And many countries experience this one. Um, according to the World Health Organization, about 90% of countries reported disruption in essential healthcare services during the first year of the pandemic. Um, and most low, middle, and income countries like the Philippines are more likely to suffer uh, from the wrath uh, because of the relatively weak healthcare system. Next slide, please. In the Philippines, um, capturing the magnitude of decline of healthcare services um, not related to COVID during the height of the pandemic was relatively hard um, because of institutional challenges. So number one is the lack of consolidated data uh, from electronic medical records from hospitals and primary care providers. We, we do not have a better understanding what's happening um, during that period. Number two is poor surveillance reporting. So as you may know, or people working this, uh, in, in the healthcare sector, surveillance data are, are submitted uh, uh, um, two years late. So we cannot measure uh, what's happening also in rural health units or in our local communities. And lastly, during the height of the pandemic, no one was interested in, in, in immunization or what's happening to our patients with hypertension. Everyone was like um, um, busy with COVID. Um, because of that lack, because of that lack of data or interest, um, um, we wanted to explore um, two data. Uh, we, ex we want to explore data collection options for us to describe a looming public health crisis. So number one, so we did two things. Number one, um, 
Uh, next slide. So, so we wanted to do things. Number one, we want to examine raw data from PhilHealth. We wanted to know whether there was a decline in claims. And number two, we wanted to collect admissions data from government hospitals and rural health units using survey. So we basically wanted to examine monthly and quarterly trends of uptake of essential healthcare services that, um, in relative, that are relatively low to begin with, right? Um, next slide. In addition to understanding the magnitude of decline of healthcare services, we also wanted to calculate the productivity losses due to mortality and morbidity of, um, I mean, morbidity attributed to COVID and non-COVID during the pandemic. So here we tried to calculate the DALIs or the disability adjusted life years, um, which is basically the sum of life years lost because of premature death uh, because of COVID and non-COVID and the disability uh, um, uh, and the resulting uh, uh, disability due to the morbidity of both COVID and non-COVID. I would not go through the mathematical intuition behind this analysis, but uh, we wanted to calculate four important estimates. So number one is the year's life loss due to COVID-19 premature death. Number two is years life loss due to disability due to COVID-19 morbidity. Number three is years life loss due to the delayed care, uh, lack of hospitalization because of lockdowns, etc. Three is years life loss uh, due to disability uh, because of non-COVID-19 morbidities or uh, decline in critical healthcare services. Like men, in, number, uh, an example of this is increase in mental health, decline in child immunization, um, increase in food insecurity, miss HIV TB treatment, HIV or TB treatment, uh, uh, increase metabolic risk like hyper, uh, hypertension or um, or diabetes, uh, and lack of physical inactivity. After calculating the disability adjusted life years, the costs associated with those losses, um, we, uh, uh, we we tried to calculate the losses um, using average wages. And for the impact of DALIs um, of the decline of services such, such as child immunization or, H, or miss HIV TB treatment or increase of metabolic conditions, we use um, an epidemiologic method called the population attributable fraction um, um, to estimate the decline or reduction in DALIs. Uh, we, use many, sir, we use many data sources here from national surveys, administrative data, uh, and uh, uh, and other uh, and, and lots of assumptions. Next slide. Okay, so let's go now to the results. So after analyzing the hospital level data from PhilHealth, um, what we see here is a huge decline um, in medical claims for twelve high burden conditions, which account for the majority of um, uh, or about eighty percent of the country's disease burden. So. And the average decline in 2020 was 57% compared um, to the same period in the previous year. So 57% is a huge decline. So the number of, of um, claims remained relatively low uh, with no signs of recovery, even the third quarter of 2020. I didn't know what happened in 2021, but the whole 2020, there was a sustained um, decline in 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 field health claims so for procedural claims like chemotherapy cataract surgery we did not see large decline next slide here if we examine by disease um, um, acute gastroenteritis which is a very common uh, disease for children asthma chronic pulmonary disease and pneumonia suffered 60 percent decline so these these conditions are very, very common um, in the population, especially children. So can you imagine 60 to 70 percent decline during COVID, during the height of the pandemic? Other than COVID, uh, other than communicable diseases such as chronic kidney disease, cancer, stroke, um, declined about 20 to 30 percent. It's 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 smaller because I think it's, I mean the decline is smaller because these are are more serious, uh, I mean life threatening. Um, but if you look at procedural claims like C-section, cataract, chemotherapy, hemodialysis, and vaginal delivery, um, only 
uh, we did not see decline in hemodialysis in C-section. The rest of the, the procedures we've examined uh, uh, demonstrated large decline. So we had another study, but we will not be discussing here, and it was published in, 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 in the regional uh, journal of the Lancet, which further examined the decline in patient claims for this condition by, by insurance membership. And based on, our, on, on, on that follow-up studies, the large decline in claims um, was, was, was reported among the sponsored or the poor indigent um, uh, members of PhilHealth. So there is an inequity angle happening in that in, in, in this story. Next line. In a, next slide. Okay. So this just shows you. Um, we wanted to show. We wanted to to examine the decline by different hospital types and provincial socioeconomic standing. So for medical claims, we for medical claims by hospital type, we see um, um, uh, uh, decline in all types of level whether public or private, right? But for for procedural claims, um, we see a compensatory mechanism going on here. Uh, in public hospital level three hospital, you see large decline, but in other types of hospitals like private hospitals, we, uh, we, they did not um, experience any declines in claims. So the, 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 the gist or the story here is that the level three public hospital um, um, suffered large decline, maybe because they shifted into an into a COVID facility. Right. Next slide. So now we look at the results for our survey of hospitals and rural health units. So using admissions data from selected government hospital, we estimated the median admissions a by quarter because monthly was hard to get. So we what we we we. we only obtain quarterly data and patient type. So we, we categorize the admissions by adult medicine, surgery, pediatrics, and ob -GYN. And what you see here is the pediatric cases uh, suffered large decline in, in, inter, in, adult, in adult internal medicine. If, and, and for surgery and ob -GYN, you see recovery and small decline. So I think the gist here is the brunt of the pandemic really happened in, 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 in vulnerable segments of the population, particularly children. Next slide. Now we'll look at the admissions or visits in rural health units. So the, pre the previous slide look at hospitals. For this one, the number of consultations in rural health units significantly declined as well, particularly um, vulnerable populations. So we look at the uh, visits of under five. You see in the left, figure large and sustained decline among under five and, and, and elderly population. Next slide. So we also look at um, the coverage of critical public health programs. Um, they suffered a major blow. Um, I mean, they, they, they suffered large decline and this is, a, this is a major blow to the country's effort in achieving health system targets. So using RHU data, you see here um, declines in TB dots um, um, or, or the consultations for TB or, or TB treatment called the direct observed therapy for, for TB. Um, and we did not see any improvement in the fourth quarter of 2020. For 2021, we don't know. We're still examining whether the decline was sustained or there was a recovery. But that would be very interesting to see. Okay, next slide. Um, this one just shows you the program data from the Department of Health, um, just reinforcing the decline in, in the uptake of critical public health programs like TB dots and HIV. You see decline in 2020, for example, almost 49% uh, decline in number of tested TB, um, number of um, Num number of diagnosed and treated and relapsed and new relapsed TB also declined. So you will see large uh, decline in many, many uh, TB indicators and similarly for HIV. Just to back up the story in our survey. Next slide. Okay, so that's for the first objective. Another objective is to examine the economic costs um, uh, attributed to, to health. Uh, because of COVID and non-COVID illnesses. Um, based on our estimation, the total lifetime years cost um, 
um, because of COVID and non-COVID is around two to two to four trillion pesos, right? But for this one, we in, we we put the lower end estimates of two point two trillion pesos. So for COVID premature death, around ninety four billion. That's the lifetime years. Um, that's the lifetime cost of of COVID premature death. Non-COVID death due to lack of healthcare around 400 billion. And I want, we want to emphasize that the, the cost of non-COVID death is actually much, much higher than the COVID premature death. Um, and you also estimated um, the foregone wages because of morbidity. So for COVID morbidity, we included long COVID around 65 billion pesos. That's the lifetime cost. And for non-COVID morbidities, as I've said, lack of immunization, decline in immunization, um, increase in food insecurity, et cetera. Um, we estimated that around 1.7 trillion pesos. So when you, when you add this, the total cost, at least for health, is around 2.2 trillion pesos. And that's the lower end estimates. So our higher end estimates are around 3 to 4 trillion. So um, next slide, please. This is just a few um, takeaways or the gist of the story. Um, children bear the brunt, uh, the brunt of the pandemic. Um, another important um, um, uh, lesson from here or message here is that the uptake of most healthcare services remained below the pre-pandemic level throughout uh, the year 2020. What happened to 2021 must be must be evaluated or must be examined. Right, that there's no substantial recovery in 2020. And we don't know what happened in 2021. Number two is rearrangement of healthcare services and healthcare resources was, was very apparent during the pandemic. Um, and in the paper, our recommendations revolve around strengthening health system, um, um, pushing for the implementation of U UHC, which looks at conditions in a more holistic fashion, looking at not only COVID, but looking at other conditions that actually um, um, implications on population health and well-being so that's that's the story behind um or that's the recommendations in in the paper in pushing for uhc and uh, for genuine health reform so i think this, this this is the gist of of our study on the multifaceted impact of the pandemic so thank you and thank you very much uh dr val Ule. okay so friends from health let's go to education which is undoubtedly uh, one of the uh, most uh, challenged sectors during the pandemic. And our uh, presenter is the current president of PIDS, Dr. Aniceto Orbeta Jr. Prior to his current role, he was a senior research fellow at uh, PIDS for 29 years, wherein he led the education and labor policy research team that studied key policy recommendations and reforms, including the Pantawid uh, Pamilyang Filipino Program, the uh, sustainable Livelihood Program and the Free Tuition Law. Dr. Arbeta also served as the officer in charge and deputy executive director for policy development and planning of the Agricultural Credit Policy Council and the deputy executive director of the Policy Development Foundation. Uh, Dr. Arbeta, the floor is now yours. Thanks, Sheila. Um, with the unprecedented total shift to remote learning because of the pandemic, a question in everyone's mind is what kind of uh, learning happened last school year uh, and, and will continue to happen this school year given the decision? As a backdrop, we'd like to, I'd like to ask to recall that before the pandemic struck, we were informed by the 2018 PISA results testing 15-year-old students and 2019 teams testing grade four students that we performed miserably compared to other countries. I will describe what happened uh, using available national representative data on our basic education system and household. Next slide, please. I uh, will use this outline and present the objectives and data and methodology, and this will be followed by a, a description of the government and our responses as well as the household responses using official data and i will describe the reachability of students and home support using a national representative household survey and i conclude with a summary and recommendations next slide please 
I designed the uh, the study uh, with uh, these uh, four object specific objectives in mind. So I want to describe the responses of the education sector, the pandemic, and describe how the students' reaction to their use of uh, uh, offered uh, learning modalities and to explain the pattern of learning modality use, uh, use uh, using household data. Uh, and this is a separate data set and describe uh, our drawing sites, I should say, or, or, and recommendations to guide uh, impl implementation of remote learning. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, there are two data sets that are uh, basic data sets that I use. One is the enrollment, uh, DepEd's enrollment data by learning a modality from the planning service of DepEd by level and by type of school. We thank uh, DepEd for that. And the second one is the 2020 Annual Poverty Indicator Survey, which provides enrollment data by level and type as well, uh, including the, but includes availability of household amenities uh, that will enable connection to remote learning such as internet, TV, radio, and cell phone and income. I also tried to find the correlation of having internet connection at home. Um, this, this is a very important uh, information on explaining what happened in the homes. So let me describe now the government responses in the next slide, please. So uh, when the, next slide please. When the uh, pandemic struck in March, 2020, they prepared uh, the basic education continuity plan of the LCP to guide the education sector's response. Uh, it listed the different learning modes uh, that uh, uh, should be used, including face-to-face -face and, uh, and uh, where there are no risk, uh, low risks, distance learning uh, that includes print, online, TV, and radio, and a combination of these methods of called, uh, they call it blended and homeschooling. As we know, the government has allowed face-to-face -face learning starting this uh, school year 2020-2021. The other important feature is the streamlining of the of, of the competencies from 14,171 to 5,689, or a reduction of 80%, uh, calling this uh, reduced set as the most essential learning competencies of metrics. Next slide, please. Uh, accompanying uh, accompanying the, the uh, uh, learning continuity plan are, are laws and department orders such as the Bayanihan, as already mentioned by Dr. Reyes, and the import, important picture of which is authorizing the hiring of learning support aids, which, which I think are very important, for teaching assistance to help in the production and reproduction of modular learning materials, and the special budgets to finance acquisition of laptops, internet productivity load, uh, TV and radio subsidies and allowances and learning modules. In addition, DepEd orders were also issued to cover assessment uh, and grading and utilization of the uh, and qualification of the uh, uh, learning support aids. Next slide, please. Uh, for me, the most revealing aspect of for which we have data for is is the uh, is uh, uh, to back up our claims is the learner's responses uh, offered uh, by the learning mortality. This is, this is shown in this slide. And this slide tells a lot of stories, so which are very important uh, for us to, to know uh, in trying to understand what happened uh, in basic education. It was uh, fortunate that the DepEd included data gathering on the learning modality used by enrolled students in school year 2020-2021 which we all know used remote learning. Uh, this is the most extensive data that can describe what happened during that school year. We would have wanted to know the extent of learning as well, but unfortunately, as far as I know, we don't have data on, 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 on the, the extent of learning. So let's, let's stick to the enrollment uh, by modality. This graph summarizes a very important pattern of learning modality. One. Important pattern is that regardless of the level, almost all of the public school students, all students in public schools are using printed modules. That is 90% in elementary, 83% in junior high school, and 80% in senior high school. On the other hand, 
we could uh, we only see a considerable proportion of uh, online learning in private schools. This is 46% in elementary, 36% in junior high school, and 44% in junior high schools. As already mentioned by Dr. Reyes uh, earlier, uh, this people describe this as a reflection of di digital divide. And in this case, this is digital divide between public and private schools. Next slide, please. Uh, no, sorry, uh, let me continue. Another pattern that I uh, uh, that I see in there is the that uh, there is considerable learning in private school uh, where, where there is considerable le uh, online learning. There's also uh, blended learning. You have also a, a big proportion of blended learning. We said a uh, likely explanation for this is, is unreliable internet connection. The state of internet connection where it is available is such that pure online learning cannot con be continuously conducted and blended learning has to be resorted to uh, because of, of, of the state of perhaps the internet connection. And finally, I'd like to highlight as well that TV and radio did not figure prominently among the learning modes. This fact is important because we will see later that uh, there is a very high uh, uh, ownership of, of, uh, of TV and radio as well as shown uh, when we look at the, the household's data. Household data. Uh, to better understand this pattern, an important question that comes to mind is whether this is more because of a lack of capacities to deliver online learning in schools, or even uh, or even with available capacities in schools, households cannot avail of, of online learning. I will answer this question in two ways. One is to look at the distribution by area, for example, by region, uh, because the lack of basic internet infrastructure can explain the lack of online learning in an area. Two, uh, use data on the availability of amenities at the household level. Uh, the next set of slides is devoted to these issues. Uh, next slide, please. Let's start with the distribution inventory by region. And this graph tells you the enrollment by region. And, and this is uh, for elementary on public on the left and private on the right. So the graph on the left shows you that the distribution of public elementary by learning modality shows that except in NCR, where it is the proportion of students on printed modules is only 50%, more than 80% uh, of students are on printed module for the rest of, for the rest of the regions. That's, that's, that's what you see in the left uh, graph. Compare this graph with the, uh, with the graph on the right describing the distribution in private schools. You see that as much as 65% in private elementary school are online in NCR. Uh, this graph tells you that it is not about the availability of internet in the area that describes access to the online modality. The internet may be available in the area, but households cannot afford online access, at least access conducive to online learning, not having uh, access at home or and intermittent access are not conducive to online learning. Next slide, please. Uh, the next slide shows you a very similar pattern uh, for junior high school. Uh, this is the same pattern that you see in elementary. And the next slide also tells you the same pattern for senior high school. Next slide, please. So uh, whatever the level, whether elementary, junior high school, and, and uh, you see that, that the public schools are, are mostly on, on printed, printed materials for NCR. Uh, so now uh, what has been described so far is uh, use data from enrollment uh, and DepEd. Let's now turn to the household data using AP's 2020 data set. This data set has enrollment data by level and by type of school as well. Uh, Thanks to PSA uh, for maintaining this data set. In uh, addition, it has data on the availability of amenities for remote learning as well as uh, uh, income levels. I use uh, measures of availability, availability of uh, amenities for remote learning as indicators of reachability. Reachability for remote learning is indicated by availability of home uh, internet access, access to TV and radio and cell phones. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Let's start with the home internet access. Uh, this graph tells you that only 12% uh, uh, of students have access to broadband internet at home. I want to point out that you may have heard 
of higher internet access from other data sources. And let me highlight that this refers to broadband internet access at home. The use of broadband internet at home is deliberate because it is the kind of a connection that uh, effectively enables continuous learning uh, at home. Uh, all the rest will be have uh, difficulty. But what is more important is that the students' internet access in private schools, uh, students who are enrolled in private schools compared to those of students enrolled in public schools is very much higher. Uh, like for example, in elementary is 60% versus 9% uh, public, uh, private public. And in, in junior high school, this is 47% versus 9%. In senior high school, this is 37% versus 10% uh, private public. This result strongly explains the disparity, uh, disparity in uh, and the use of online learning and, and the uh, domin uh, the preponderance of using of printed modules among public schools compared to students in pub uh, in, uh, in public schools compared to students in private schools, as I've shown already by the uh, learning by modality data. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the next slide tries to explain uh, what uh, what are the correlates of bro having broadband internet at home, and I try I use uh, EPS data with the uh, and 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 merge it with the infrastructure available in the area available uh, in, from the Albert et al. Uh, study, which used the DICT household survey. Uh, uh, ICT survey and and uh, this table uh, tells us that the results are quite revealing. It is reported that the, uh, uh, the table uses standardized uh, coefficients which should be interpreted as the in standard deviation units. Uh, it shows that uh, and it shows that the presence of the broadband infrastructure in the area is, is the most important correlate of the availability of internet at home. It says that uh, one standard deviation, for instance. Uh, change in the presence of the broadband infrastructure is correlated with 0.45 standard deviation change in the availability of home and the internet. This is followed by per capita income with 0.34 standard deviation, family size with 0.19 standard deviation, uh, and uh, parents with high school education 0.11 standard deviation. That's that's uh, so basically it's the infrastructure. What determines availability of broadband internet is the availability of infrastructure plus the next uh, determinants are, are, are income, family size, and, and, and parents in, with high school education. Next slide, please. So the next slide tells you about uh, the case of TV, TV and radio. And, and, and you see here that the disparity in access is not too different between public and private schools. In addition, and more importantly, is the access is quite high, uh, or uh, availability is quite high, I should say. Uh, Eighty percent and above for TV, and thirty-five percent and above for radio. But uh, I then got to recall that the enrollment data never sh shown earlier. Uh, this kinds, this kinds of availability will never uh, reflected on, in terms of pro proportion of students using TV and radio. Next slide, please. Uh, the next slide tells you about uh, cell phones. Uh, cell phones can be used in some sense. Uh, uh, Finally, this uh, availability of cell phones tells you that there's again there's no uh, uh, large disparity between public and private school students. More importantly, the access is almost universal. Uh, so, 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 uh, so that's that's the, so. What has been shown so far is average reachability. Our next uh, thing that I'd, I'd look at is how is the reachability by socioeconomic class, which is as shown by the next set of slide. Next slide, please. Uh, reachability basically is summarized in this graph. So this is this combination of the leftmost board, the accessibility of the broadband by, by income classes. Uh, the second one is availability of computers. This one, the middle is TV, radio, and cell phones. So you, you will uh, uh, see here that by, by income classes, the, there's a large disparity, uh, disparity across uh, access to broadband and computer, but not so much for TV radio and cell phones. So that's, that's the story of this. Uh, so across uh, income classes, it's only the, the availability of broadband and, and computer with some large disparity across income classes. So finally, I'd like to show you how, what's the quality of home support for learning. As uh, our study in, in uh, using PISA, next slide please, 
uh, uh, shows you that uh, shows us that the that uh, the that even with face-to-face -face learning, the quality of home support is a very strongly correlated with test scores. So I tried to look at uh, what kind, what is the quality of home support. So in the, in the absence of a teacher, uh, the importance of home support for learning should be, even be more critical. I tried to describe this with this, this graph uh, by highest education qualification of parents. Basically, uh, uh, the, the, this graph tells you about the proportion of uh, uh, parents with high school that are high school graduates by income classes. So you will see here. That, that the average is about 10% of, of, of our high school graduates and above. Uh, and for the richest quintile, this is 28% and 3% for the lowest quintiles. So there is a disparity in, in the quality of home support. Uh, uh, of course, not uh, uh, use, uh, not included here is that the, the poor may be, we need to work uh, outside the home and will be out uh, most of the time rather than helping their students. Uh, again, this will have uh, Proper implications for learning. So, next slide. And uh, let's uh, let me summarize uh, with uh, with six statements what we just uh, have gone through. Most of the students in public schools use printed modules for all levels: elementary, junior high school, and senior high school. Second, only the private schools that uh, uh, will one find a considerable proportion of students on online and on, on blended learning. There is a significant disparity in the internet access at home, uh, particularly for broadband internet, which is conducive for uh, home, uh, home lear learning and uh, between students enrolled in public, private and public schools across education levels. And number four is that the availability of the internet at home is correlated with the presence of urban infrastructure in the area and income. And number five, that the availability of TV and radio is high and there is, but uh, and there's not much difference between public and private students, but uh, this is the same uh, true uh, with uh, uh, it's also true for cell phones uh, with even higher availability. There is a wide disparity of distribution of either parents uh, being a, a high school graduate among income quintiles. Let uh, me the last two slides on the recommendations. Uh, First recommendation, next slide, please. So the online mode of learning, uh, what we have seen is that online mode of learning will not reach most of the public school students. That's, that's, that's what the data is saying. Uh, however, forward looking we are, or uh, desirable is that, uh, that we want to build capacities on online learning. Uh, 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 even if we provide it in public schools, so the students will not be able to access it at home. So that's basic. That's one uh, implication of what of the data they said. So hence the desire to build uh, online learning capacity at this time will not be the most effective uh, at the present time, uh, desirable as it may be over the long term. Uh, so what then is most effective? Uh, we second uh, said that the primary and exceeding concern is to support the learning of the most popular mode, which is printed modules. What's needed is supporting the uh, printed modules. And uh, one of the uh, recent uh, survey of the World Bank uh, office uh, highlighted the lack of interaction between teachers and students. So there are already examples in the literature and in other countries of using cell phones to improve the interaction between teachers and students and parents. Uh, and these have been shown to be effective. So this, these are some of the things that we should uh, be looking at that uh, not to, to, to dream about online learning because our students are not yet there, but perhaps we should do an intermediate uh, use and more strategic use of technologies like cell phones to increase the interaction between teachers and students using their cell phones. Okay. Uh, the other thing that we we would like, uh, we would observe is that, and the third is that the education delivery through TV and theory needs to be improved because we have high ownership of, uh, TV and radio, but you you don't see that reflected in the enrollment um, using uh, TV and radio uh, modalities. That's that's the third one. And next, the last slide. Uh, uh, the we should address the disparity in the quality of home support by socioeconomic classes. In the absence of teachers, uh, home support is critical. And, uh, and the data on quality of home support is, is showing us uh, uh, that the home, um, 
home support by socioeconomic class is, 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 is there's large disparity. One of the possible, as I've mentioned already, mentioned especially the, the use of learning support aids. Uh, one possible way of addressing this is, is using learning support aids to target and support uh, poorer households where there is not uh, uh, no home support that can be expected. Now, uh, five that the address the anticipated learning disparity by socioeconomic class with remote learning. Since it's clear that remote learning, as practiced, discriminates against students from poorer households because of the lack of interaction and more inferior quality of home support, interventions should to counteract this tendency should be found. Examples, as I've said, uh, uh, promote the interaction between teachers and students, and one of the one of the ways that you can do that is using your cell phones. And another one is target home support for children of low educated parents. Finally, uh, recognize the need for massive remedial measures to address the low test scores. Even before the pandemic, you already said that I mean, I started, we should remember that we have been performing very poorly uh, in, 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 in large scale assessments. And so, uh, and that is uh, that those results were uh, taken during the face to face learning. So we are already uh, have low uh, education outcomes. So by that, uh, we need the massive re remedial. Now we go into remote learning, uh, which have which are uh, as most people would, would ask, would have a lower uh, lower uh, effectiveness uh, than 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 face to face. So. That we added to the already low performance, we should be really planning for a massive remedial measures uh, for our schools. And the other thing that I would like to highlight is that these remedial learnings should focus on uh, poor households because of uh, there is a, the disparity already that, that, that and, and even uh, uh, exacerbated with the, with the pandemic, uh, uh, the learning during the pandemic. That's my last statement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Abeta, for that um, insightful uh, presentation. So friends, as our uh, final presentation, let us look at the impacts of the pandemic on the macroeconomy. And the um, comprehensive chapter on this topic was written by Dr. Maggie Debu Debuque Gonzalez, who's also a senior research fellow at PIDS. Dr. Gonzalez is a uh, Research expertise includes monetary, financial, and macroeconomics. And before joining PIDS, she was an associate professor at the University of the Philippines School of, Eco School of Economics, where she headed the Financial and International Economics Committee and the Union Bank Center for Financial and Monetary Economics. She also served as a consultant to various government agencies and international financial institutions and was a country advisor for several years at Global Source Partners. Maggie, you may proceed. Okay, thank you. Can I um, first share my slide? Okay. I hope everybody can um, see my slide. Yes, we can see it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, also, like Val, I'd like to uh, thank PIDS for allowing me um, to um, write this um, chapter, uh, especially thanks to former president, um, Dr. Celia, for um, giving me this, this uh, big chance to chronicle what happened to the Philippine economy during the pandemic. Okay, so this, um, sorry. So this is how our chapter looks like. Uh, the the title is Navigating the COVID-19 Storm, Impact of the Pandemic on the Philippine Economy and Macro Responses of Government. We tackle several areas uh, such as the effect on the economy, uh, how the crisis looks like in perspective to previous crisis, looks at uh, macro responses of government to the crisis, and then gives a short review of the monetary fiscal policy combination during the pandemic crisis and sort of lays a path forward. Now, I just like uh, to uh, note that this chapter was written actually first quarter of 2021. So if, if some of the um, materials seem dated, um, it's because it's, it was written in Q1. And so 
here for this presentation, I sort of uh, try to um, crystallize what what uh, is useful going forward, uh, despite uh, sort of the the, the data uh, being cut uh, in the first quarter of 2021. Okay, so um, the for the first part, I just uh, for I just give you like to give you the highlights. If you want uh, a longer discussion, it's all in the book. All the graphs or all, all the uh, details will be in the book. So I'll just give snapshots of what are the main uh, findings or main highlights of the chapter. So in terms of the economic impact of the pandemic, I, I, there were five impressions uh, that were sort of uh, indicative of what happened during the time. We had the deepest crisis in post-war history because we had a pandemic standstill. Uh, we had lockdowns, um, there was social distancing, etc. So we, ha we had the deepest crisis we ever had. We had a rare collapse in services. We had a breakdown in household sp spending. We had a mixed impact on inflation and we had um, severe job and income insecurity. Okay, so this is the graph of GDP growth. So if you can see, this is from 1950 to, to 2020. So if you can see it, uh, the COVID uh, recession was really the deepest. The next deepest was way back in the mid 1980s where you had uh, both a debt crisis and a political crisis. So you had a, a simultaneous debt and political crisis and uh, GDP dropped by 7% during that time. Here in COVID-19 uh, pandemic, you had a pandemic standstill and uh, GDP dropped by 9.6%. Uh, now to, um, what is the reason for this drop um, on the part of on the industry side? It's really because of a rare collapse in services. Now the services sector used to be less than 50% of GDP, but starting 1990s onward, it accounted for about uh, close to 60% or around 60%. And so uh, with services dropping by 9.2%, so you can see in the draft graph that services dropped by 9.2%, this means that your 9.6% uh, drop in GDP, a large part of that over six percentage points is really due to a uh, drop in services. So again, if you look at it historically, the deepest drop in services goes back to the to the 1980s, to the mid 1980s. In 1984, when services dropped by 6.1 percent, we also had uh, on the expenditure side, we also had a rare collapse in household spending. So household uh, spending also accounts for uh, for a large uh, part of aggregate demand, about uh, maybe 70 percent. So again, a large part of the 9.6% drop is due to a household spending drop of about 7.9%. Um, now this one is the most sort of uh, phenomenal because we've never, never really seen household spending drop by this much. Um, if ever it dropped, it was only about 0.5% and that was way back again in the mid 1980s. Okay, uh, now if you look at the impact of the pandemic on inflation, uh, this is where you will see how you do not have your regular crisis. Okay, Re this is really not your regular crisis. This is not a crisis that is due to financial excess. It is a mixture of both a su negative supply shock and a negative demand shock. And you will see that in your inflation. If you have a supply shock, then you will see supply bottlenecks you will see um, output going down at the same time that prices are going up. And you will see that particularly in your transport service. Uh, we will show you the, the summary later. Now, if you have a demand shock, okay, remembering your macroeconomics, you are moving along the supply curve, which means that there's a consumption decline and there's a price deceleration if you have a negative demand shock. And we see that in the sectors that are high contact centers, sectors, they are contact intensive. So they're the ones that are now being uh, restricted. So these are your sectors such as your restaurants and hotels, recreation and culture, clothing, footwear, education, etc. 
Okay, of course, there are other factors to inflation, such as the impact of the um, uh, the rice certification law, which has helped bring down um, um, rice prices, and also the fact that oil prices are going down uh, due to the pandemic. So here is a graph showing you uh, the movement of inflation, Q3 versus Q1 in 2020, and the change in household spending. So you can see, if you look at the transport sector, you can see the two bars, the blue bars and the red bar going in opposite direction. So that's where you have a supply shock. And we know why that happened is because the public utility uh, vehicles were not allowed to ply. And so there were other, uh, like the tricycles had to sort of fill the gap. And so you saw uh, prices of fares going up. And then, you have you distinctly see demand declines in sectors that are high contact, such as your restaurants and your and your hotels, where both the blue bar and the red bar are moving in the same direction, uh, meaning uh, leftward. So you have see that in education, recreation, uh, etc. Okay? And of course, you also see other sectors that uh, have um, um, spending going up, such as in communication. Okay? So the, that's for inflation. So uh, the dark legacy, I, I, I sort of call it the dark legacy, the really big impact of COVID is on income and jobs, incomes and jobs. Okay, there was high insecurity. Uh, there were four, I think, impressions that I uh, sort of picked up on. One was that it was only agriculture, which saw a sizable gain in number of workers during the pandemic in 2020. Um, jobs were lost in construction and services, and these were especially in domestic trade um, and vehicle repair, uh, transport and storage, accommodation and food. Uh, then you had sustained employment growth only for own account workers, those without family farms or business or any paid employee. You also saw sustained, sustained decline in the number of wage and salary workers particularly those in private establishments. So about 5.5 million jobs were lost during the time. Okay, so looking at the COVID-19 pandemic crisis in perspective, essentially what I wanted to look at was how different was it in terms of how vulnerable we were during when, that, when, the, when the pandemic crisis happened. So we have to qualify it. It was really a rare public health shock that came during a time of uninterrupted growth and relatively good macro fundamentals. So that was the good part. And the good part also was that we seem to have learned our lessons. So from the mid 1980s, debt and political crisis, the lesson was a need for disciplined public sector. And we learned from that episode that we needed to keep our deficits and our debt at sustainable levels. Okay, no profligacy. Uh, let's uh, let's have you know uh, a well-functioning um, fiscal system, uh, etc. From the Asian financial crisis, the lesson was the importance of a disciplined financial sector. Okay, so from that crisis came a number a wave of regulatory reforms. We had greater exchange rate flexibility after that, and we also learned to somehow accumulate our so somehow build our reserves in in in, a, in the event of another crisis so the good news was that the philippines entered the crisis the covid 19 crisis with a healthy financial sector our banks had low uh, npls we had high reserves uh, fx reserves our deficits were controlled we had low public and especially low external debt so unlike Past crisis, uh, the country did not have to deal with the peso free fall and high inflation rates. Instead, we had external surpluses, peso appreciation, and mild inflation up to the end of the year, 2020. So to summarize, the bright areas during the pandemic were an external surplus, currency stability, moderate inflation, and a surprise was the surprising acceptance of financial markets of alternative forms of financing. And here I'm talking specific, specifically about the short-term lending arrangement between the central bank and the national government. Now, 
again, we talk about COVID-19 being different. So I'll just go very quickly into this and how different it was from the other crisis. So from, we know from our textbook crisis, we're familiar with the, with the financial boom and bust, and then there are banks become weak and they can't lend. And so you have your financial sector crisis becoming a real sector crisis. Here, it's not that. It's, a, it's not a financial crisis. It's a complex combination of aggregate supply and aggregate demand shocks. It's uh, the feature is really sectoral shutdowns. You have sectors that are closed. So the closed sector, it has complementary sectors. And if the closed sector, uh, well, if it's closed, then the complementary sector will also weaken. And the complementary sectors uh, that are complementary to the complementary sectors will also weaken. So, the, so this will now spread. So even if you have an aggregate supply shock, it eventually becomes an aggregate demand uh, deficient uh, recession. So that's why you call it a Keynesian supply shock. It's a supply sh negative supply shock that morphs into negative demand shocks. Okay, so in that case, you have uh, sectors that are shut down and therefore uh, the usual way you attack a crisis is cannot really be uh, the case because if you're talking about fiscal spending, fiscal multipliers in a pandemic are not working because sectors are shut down, it's particularly in shutdown sectors while on lockdown. Okay, so that's the sort of uh, looking at the nuts and bolts of the crisis. And I thought of putting together a pandemic policy primer. So I'll just go quickly. This is based on the literature, based on what I've read, what, I've, what uh, the theoretical uh, literature is there. So one, swift and strong policy action is critical in any crisis. Number two, you should treat the pandemic as you would a natural disaster because analytically they are the same. And how do you treat that? You treat that with ample relief spending. So Krugman 2020 is the one uh, um, the most vocal about this. The risk of negative financial market spillovers remains, and therefore you can use standard monetary policy, uh, for instance, policy rate cuts to offset the decline in, in market risk tolerance, or you could use even non-standard policy, such as large scale asset purchases to transfer some of the risk to the government. Optimal policy, be, policy, be, policy would be to combine monetary loosening with abundant social protection for workers in closed sectors. So this is what you can do in the relief stage. In the recovery stage, there is less emphasis on traditional fiscal policies for the time being, and you only use them when the multipliers start to function again, meaning when your economy starts to open. Okay, not, uh, so the problem with this list is this, sorry, this list, it's uh, sort of a whatever it takes uh, uh, approach, it is not feasible for developing countries. Not all policy prescriptions uh, mentioned may be feasible in countries that have weaker systems for healthcare and social protection services and which have more constrained fiscal space. The trade-off between flattening the infection curve and flattening the recession curve is harsher in developing countries because of the institutional capacity, the limited capacity and greater vulnerability. Ideal solution is you want to nip it the bud, you soften the trade off early through prompt containment efforts and widespread testing and trace, tracing. Otherwise, you have to resort to blanket lockdowns. But even blanket lockdowns, there are alternatives to blanket lockdowns when the infection risk is not at its peak. You could instead use targeted policies for different age and risk groups and then use testing, isolation, and the like uh, as complementary measures. Okay, so um, actually, Louise and Pennings from the World Bank already have a primer, and I think this is pretty much what the government has, uh, has followed, where you delineate relief and recovery. So there's a relief phase and a recovery phase, and then you have these um, measures uh, that are appropriate for each phase. So if when you're in relief mode, you spend for public health care, you support your workers, you support your households, you support your small businesses, you do standard monetary uh, easing. If you're in the recovery phase, that's the only time that you start to use uh, like fiscal stimulation. So you switch from crisis management to macro stimulation. 
Okay, in countries where the multipliers and transmission mechanisms are weak, you can have alternative goals such as avoid simply avoiding procyclicality, uh, continue just simply continue provision of public goods and services, including health care, and just simply aim for macro stability. Okay, so this is a very nice way of looking at it. The problem is you cannot really tell when you are in relief and when you are in recovery. Sometimes the virus is so uncertain, the path of the virus is so uncertain that you cannot really tell. So there's no clear line between relief and recovery for as long as there's uncertainty about COVID-19. And the sensible goal would be to simply alleviate the harsh effects of the pandemic while trying to prevent amplification of shocks. So you don't want the the, risk, the the crisis to become a financial crisis, in other words. So again, this is another interesting area. We have two uh, main authors here, and they're basically, I won't explain it, you can read the book, but basically what they're saying is that this time, you are not going to amplify the crisis through the financial sector, it will be amplified through corporate balance sheets, meaning uh, the companies that have reduced uh, uh, cash flow, they lose their workers and they close, and therefore that's going to affect your economy. So the goal in a pandemic is to evergreen SMEs, you prevent inefficient bankruptcy. So this links to the economic scoring because uh, one feature of economic scarring is business closures. So the small businesses that you know can survive the pandemic, you try to keep them alive. And you try to do that through ample uh, financing programs. Okay, so that's... Uh, so uh, again, if for some countries this may have uh, limited success because of continued uncertainty and credit heightened credit risk so even if you if you loosen let's say monetary policy the the borrowers might you know the the households and the, the firms sorry might not borrow and so uh you could have other ways you know, so what you want to do is lower the risk in in the in the economy and so you do do that by transferring some of the risk to government to government balance sheets through capitalization of state-owned banks, scale up of credit guarantee programs, large scale purchases of portfolios of loans, et cetera. Okay. So um, reviewing in reviewing the monetary and fiscal policy responses, I just like to take note of some things. One, the COVID-19 crisis is still essentially a public health crisis. So it really demanded a strong public health response for a robust economic recovery. Now, macro fundamentals remain important even if it had been powerless to prevent a recession. So the, the argument there is really just a counterfactual. What if we had the pandemic when we also had poor macro fundamentals? Asset programs of EMEs were a surprising game changer. They lowered financial sector risk and provided leaders uh, breathing space. So this is the market acceptance uh, as I said, of the lending arrangements between uh, government and their central banks. So, so far, the country has been able to maintain an image of fiscal responsibility and fundamental strength, only one negative outlook in 2020. But a protracted struggle to contain the pandemic makes it harder to continue this balance of protecting the vulnerable and shoring up the economy given the limited fiscal resources that we have. So this, this is a list of, I won't discuss it, it's in the book. Uh, this is a list of the monetary response of government. So you have four categories, measures that uh, support liquidity, measures that are meant to provide regulatory relief for, for the financial institutions, uh, measures that are intended to support MSME lending and other NG support measures such as remittances uh, of uh, BSP uh, advanced to the national government. And again, this uh, agreement between uh, the national treasury and government, okay, short-term lending of the, of the BSP to the national government. For the fiscal response, again, uh, we have four types to its relief. So the first phase, this one comes in phases. There's the relief phase, uh, which is mostly by Yanihan 1. Then the relief and recovery phase by Yanihan 2. Then you have the reset, rebound, recover, which is in the national budget of 2021. And then you have create. 
which is a supply side stimulus uh, of the government. So, um, so again, it's in the book if you want to see the details. So I just give a quick review overall in terms of monetary response, the positive side of it. Overall, the country has been able to put together an appropriate set of monetary responses based on the conceptual framework provided. Ample liquidity has helped relieve market stress and avert financial instability. We've seen that happen. Uh, regulatory relief has lessened the pressure on financial institutions and policy has correctly focused on MSMEs and households. In terms of fiscal response, the positives are is that except for the permanent tax cuts, the country's fiscal response has pretty much followed the accepted playbook with proper sequencing of relief and recovery measures. The initial aim was to provide relief to workers, households and businesses through Bayanihan 1 at the height of the crisis. They shifted to a more tar targeted approach under Bayanihan 2 and incorporated more stimulus elements in the 21, 2021 budget. So they also correctly focused on households and firms through cash transfers and grants, payments relief and tax exemptions uh, and deductions. Okay, so now we go to the negative side of it. From the monet on the monetary side, financial conditions collapsed during the pandemic, uh, looking at liquidity, stress and risk. Credit standards tightened, credit demand weakened. So what the BSP did was correctly so, they tried to inject liquidity. So about uh, 1.9 trillion or 9.6% was injected into the financial system by mid-October 2020. But uh, as of time of writing, around uh, 1.5 trillion or greater was actually lodged in the liquidity management facilities of the central bank. So this was despite efforts to support domestic liquidity, it was going back to, to, the, to their own uh, management uh, liquidity. Man so the banks, why, why is this, this so? Banks were worried about their balance sheets and bottom lines. And of course, they would want to seek haven in risk-free instruments, which were offered also by the BSP. So they also were, you could also see that kind of behavior in their bid to, to set aside uh, provisions for loan losses in order to protect themselves against a weak economy. Okay, so, so as a result, policy observers <coughs> saw this procyclical pro behavior of banks as evidence that the central bank was just pushing on a string. So this highlighted the need for a better balance between fiscal and monetary responses. Now on the fiscal side, while the COVID-19 standing may seem unremarkable in the Asian context, the Philippines, as Dr. Celia said, really actually embarked on a, on a wide and um, an ambition, ambitious program in terms of proportion of population coverage. The problem was there was the, there were the expected glitches in trying to uh, deliver the social services. You had incomplete list of beneficiaries, absence of national ID system and a unified database. You had physical handling of cash, which made distribution unsafe in terms of infection and also prone to corruption and leakage. However, for peace related performance invites some optimism that yeah, you could uh, uh, improve a lot in that area, especially if you have digital digital delivery. Uh, traditional forms of public spending proved even harder. So following Bayanihan 1, public works were postponed and canceled while uh, limited operating capacity due to quarantines led to implementation delays of remaining projects. The public infra program was actually revised downwards in 2020 and actually fell by a fifth. Okay, and then the final point is that tax cuts in the fiscal package may not be, so this was as of time of writing, again, to qualify, may not be a major source of fiscal stimulus in the near term if you are faced with continued weakness of aggregate demand. So the full benefits of CREATE would be more likely in the longer term. So the key lessons, so I'm, now, I'm down to the key lessons, what are the key le lessons? One key lesson is remember the lesson. <laughs> so it's remember the past lessons. And we did that. And that is simply to say, you know, maintain economic fundamentals. Okay, follow a playbook. 
We've also seen that this will help plan and coordinate your macro responses. Okay, so you, we, we want to have a better balance next time of the fiscal monetary response. Um, then the third lesson is get lessons from the literature because they actually help. So some of, I think, the most important lessons in the literature that I saw were one by Ma et al. 2020, who said that countries with larger first year responses in government spending, especially on healthcare, exhibited faster recovery. So that already shows you where to spend on. Then another by Guerrieri et al., which said that uh, social insurance or social protection for affected workers in closed sectors where or where social distancing is required is the best way to prevent Keynesian supply shocks triggering demand shortages. Um, in a pandemic crisis, shock amplification will likely be through corporate balance sheets due to sharp cash flow reductions, especially of small firms, and therefore the goal should be to prevent inefficient bankruptcies. Okay, and then finally, there's a growing body of research support that we already know about the quicker way out of a pandemic Keynesian slump. So this is your textbook uh, pandemic, uh, sorry, textbook crisis. And you do that by raising investor confidence, consumer confidence, and by indirect uh, injection of demand. So how do you raise investor and consumer confidence in a pandemic? Well, through successful containment and vaccination. So we saw that. And then um, how do you directly inject demand? Again, the things that we have already done, such as provide cash grants, provide cheap credit or grants for small firms, especially those with sustainable businesses. Okay, so um, yeah, so the policy challenges moving forward. I sort of rewrote this for today because some of the things I wrote in the chapter uh, were fortunately seem to have been listened to. And so I think uh, we have no problem in that area. But maybe the remaining issues is that uh, though uh, COVID-19 may eventually be considered endemic, developing countries, including the Philippines, would still need to prepare for a resurgence of the disease and possible emergence of another pandemic. Translate, you still need to invest in your healthcare system and make it stronger. Number two, policymakers will need to optimally time the country's exit strategy for COVID-19 support measures to minimize macroeconomic uh, risk. Uh, translation of that is that don't pull out your measures too soon unless you are sure that uh, this this will really not uh, destabilize yet uh, uh, the economy. Okay, so you have to, uh, and again, the BSP has been very vocal about their evidence-based uh, approach. Uh, there are really two things that uh, people are looking out for. One is what happens when you take away forbearance measures, and number two is what uh, what happens um, if the uh, the arrangement be between the national government and uh, uh, and um, BSP, the lending arrangement is is ended, and I think we've seen good endings in that regard. Number three, the government will have to act to avert the risk of economic scarring due to a protracted pandemic crisis, but it will also need to have a sound fiscal strategy to maintain macroeconomic stability. So also related to number uh, two. Uh, it means that we still need to spend, actually, we do need to spend because we're coming out of a pandemic and we have what they call economic scarring. We have to know the extent of that scarring and we have to address that scarring, okay? But at the same time, we have high debt, uh, okay? And so we need to signal to the market that we're doing what it what is needed to mend the economy, but at the same time, uh, we are going to keep our eye uh, on the on the fiscal picture. Okay, so for Philippine recovery, I think uh, um, just to add to what uh, others in the government are already saying, I just like to boil it down to two key elements. One, uh, you have to nurse the economy back to health. Okay, so again, do what it's needed to prevent scarring. 
uh, the important areas for public spending are still social protection, health infrastructure, and education. Okay, so the other element is one should maintain, we should maintain investor and business confidence while doing so. Okay, so the main concerns of, are, of course, the fiscal picture, fiscal deficits and debt, possible, uh, you know, uh, concerns about misuse of, you know, uh, of, of, of spending, okay, um, et cetera. Okay, that's all. Thank you. I hope, uh, yeah. And thank you very much, uh, <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Gonzalez, for that uh, insightful presentation. Okay, uh, very um, important uh, policy challenges uh, moving forward and uh, the two elements for the Philippine recovery, which, which you highlighted, uh, which I think uh, ties up with uh, the recommendations of given in the uh, other presentations. Okay, so friends, um, at this point, Point. Uh, we hope that the four presentations have given you a flavor of the rich data and insights that you can find in the book. Uh, we won't have a poll today, but um, we will give a prize to four participants in the audience who will um, join in the open forum and each will receive a printed copy of the book when it is off the press. Currently, the e-file is available on the PIDS website. So at this point, our presenters are ready to, uh, to take your questions. So may I request our speakers to turn on your video so the audience can see you. So I think, let me check our chat box. We have two questions from the audience. And let me start with the first question. Okay, this one is from Josh, Joshua uh, Magsumbol. Uh, okay, and let me read this question. Was there political pressure versus medical advisory on the issue regarding the use of ivermectin as adjunct to COVID-19 treatment? Does this mean politics can take over in lieu of evidence-based studies? What can we learn from all that has transpired? Okay, uh, well, I think this refers to, uh, uh, if, if you will recall, there were certain politicians who called, called on the DOH and FDA to consider ivermectin as a preventive treatment for COVID, but the DOH and FDA have both warned against it given it's given insufficient evidence supporting its safety and efficacy for COVID-19. I mean, we hear from our health expert. <laughs> okay, uh, okay the, bye. <laughs> thank you Joshua for your question I think that the, the short answer to this is I think we have um, there are critical um, parts of the UHC law that, that that could be further enhanced for example the institutionalization of the health technology assessment when you have a robust health technology assessment the government should not pay for ineffective and not cost effective interventions like ivermectin so we need to really make sure that the health technology assessment should be working to protect us from political interferences, right? So I think that's the main idea, to strengthen institutions. And we have existing laws to strengthen those institutions. Okay. Thank you very much, Val. We have another question, and I think this is also for you. This is from Karen May from uh, the PSA, and she said uh, she would like to ask, about the decline in high burden diseases presented that the health that the phil health data declined from 2019 to 2020 does the presentation signify that the poorest population has a better health condition in 2020 what are some dimensions or measures of the government to monitor individuals that have previous records of high burden diseases that assures or monitors that they have that that they already that they have overcome or or have been treated uh, of their past illnesses. Uh, Val, uh, I think she's referring to your slide uh, seven. Okay. Okay. Healthcare for high burden diseases, which sharply declined during the first year of the pandemic. Okay, Th thank you, Karen, for your question. So, what it means is. A lot of patients, particularly with those chronic conditions, for example, hypertension or those with cancer, 
uh, 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 diagnosis um, are not seeking care because of various reasons. It can be economic because lack of income or due to lockdowns, etc. So many reasons. So it means is um, they're not seeking care. So this is translated into foregone care, which is actually more, which is a serious problem. Yung mas mahirap dati, before the pandemic, uh, they're not seeking care or they're not usually seeking care. But now, mas hindi sila nag-seek ng care. So yun yung, yun yung challenge natin. It's, it's actually foregone care. It's not because nawala yung sakit nila. Um, when you have cancer, when you have hypertension, doesn't mean na when you're not seeking care, gumaling ka na. Nagstay ka lang sa bahay. And they went unattended, right? And how to address that? On how do we how do we assess whether they have already uh, recovered, etc. Is the push for um, better information system, uh, the use of electronic medical records at the individual level that allows us to track the progress or a trajectory of a patient at the individual level. When you go to RHU, nagbabakod bakod pa rin tayo, so we don't know the trajectory of. A particular patient. So when you want to look at the longitudinal nature or the longitudinal um, or the trajectory of a particular patient, kung anong yari siya, we need to institutionalize reforms in the information technology or health information technology. And I think the Department of Health is actually move um, is pushing for this. But of, obviously, mabag uh, uh, mas dapat bilisan pa natin mas marami pa dapat na RHU yung mga ng electronic medical records and how do we make it um, at the individual level na hindi lang tayo nagbabakod bakod sa rural health units no? so yun yung um, sagot ko for for that question okay thank you very much for the clarification Val, on the uh, on uh, what that slide uh, means no um, so we go to uh, our next um, participant uh, who has a question and it, this is from Florencio. Okay. Okay. Florencio Mungoso and may, may I um, um, throw this question to our volume editor, Dr. Reyes. What guidance can you give to LGUs on their recovery efforts since the ill effects of the pandemic is more telling at the local level considering that we are catering to warm bodies day in and day out? Any thoughts, Ma'am Sel? Yeah. I, I think we need to recognize the important role of lo local government units. So, so far we have been focusing on, on national because there seems to be, um, from what we're seeing, um, lack of, um, I think, um, or well-coordinated response at the local level. So each LGU has its own system. They have their own, um, they're doing uh, whatever they can, but they also have limited resources, varying resources. So um, I, I think um, what the book is trying to say is there's a space for um, greater coordination. And um, um, I, I think we also wanted to highlight in, in the book that we always say whole of government approach, um, but there's scope for improving how we operationalize that whole of government approach so that national government and LGU efforts are more coordinated. Thank you very much, Ma'am Sel. Okay, let's uh, jump to another question. And this one is from, okay, from Ro Rochelle, Rochelle Zita Bantige. What was the reason why our country was not aggressive in contact tracing? Is it because we do not have the tools of, or the technology to do so? Uh, Val, would you like to uh, provide your answer to this question? Okay. Uh, um, thank you, Rochelle, for your question. I will link this. I will link my answer to Mam Sel's um, response. No, because when you think about it, before the pandemic, there was an assessment of the World Health. Or, I mean, there was an assessment of the of the, the central DOH that only two provinces as a functional surveillance system. When you think about it, the the fun, the, the the, um, the 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 that function that surveillance function is actually lies sa local government it's not the national government when you look at really the functions of the different um government systems no as a function siya ng local government but there was an assessment before the pandemic na dalawang probinsya lang yung may functional na ganong sistema 
So again, there's a limited capacity of local governments to do these kinds of basic public health programs. But the question is, after the pandemic, that improved ba? It is the is is the is, is the bigger question, and we need to address that, right? Um, and I hope nagbago siya. Um, so local government talaga yung 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 center um, of the response, and the capacity should be actually examined. Uh, so yun lang po. Thank you very much, Val. Okay. Uh huh. Okay. Another question, and this time from Aljo Quintans. How was SAP able to contribute in mitigating public sentiment? Do you think it, it do you think it is the right way to recovery? Um this was um covered by uh Dr. Celia in, in her presentation. And it we saw that it has um uh ha, it has a positive impact in terms of uh alleviating the uh impacts of uh the COVID nineteen Mamsel. Yeah, the, the social, uh, the SAP or social amelioration program is actually has been very helpful in terms of um, helping households smooth their consumption. Um, but as I said, it's a temporary measure. It's something that uh, would help them, you know, uh, be able to satisfy their needs for two months, in fact, a few months, um, but not enough actually for them to recover. And, and I think the book the different chapters are consistent. Maggie's um, presentation earlier also echoed that, that um, we need to um, also consider beyond the relief phase. So SAP can be considered more as um, you know, a program, um, as a relief package, but we also need to think more about how to help households recover from the shock. And, and for that, we need um, more than just the cash transfers in the form of SAP. Okay. Thank you very much, Mamsel. Uh, from the well, um, Edi uh, the well Bangsal of um, CPBRD, and this one is from um, Dr. Deboke. Um, the DOF recently suggested a number of fiscal reforms with fiscal consolidation as an anchor to reduce debt to GDP ratio at uh, 55% in 2025. This is also key to grow out of our pandemic-induced debt, given the public sentiment you think this is the right way to recovery and um another related question to this uh maggie is um is the current uh you know is our current debt position today uh, a re a cause for concern compared to a uh, previous debt crisis okay uh yeah so let, I'll start with the easier one, the one, the question of Sheila. Uh, so the debt, uh, debt rose by like 20 percentage points. So the good news about that is I think about six percentage points of the initial increase in debt was really just the national government, the national treasury, trying to build up cash reserves, trying to build up, uh, it's basically accumulate, accumulated uh, uh, liquid assets. Okay, so meaning if they want to bring it down by six percentage points, I said right now, they could, I think, I think, I think, theoretically, I think they can do it. Okay, uh, but of course, they have other uses for that cash buffer. So, yeah, in that sense, it's not, it's not as if we were back in the like the 1980s or in 2004 where uh, the reasons for the debt were different, uh, where we have, for instance, declining tax effort or because we had, you know, um, uh, uh, debt that was not really used for productive uses of the economy. Okay. Now, the first question is harder because I don't know what is meant by the given public, given the public sentiment. What, public sentiment are we talking about? <laughs> well, that's one. Uh, so I'd like clarity on what public sentiment is. I think I have an idea what we are all talking about. Uh, I think that uh, whatever that is, that is unspoken, <laughs> is I think that is, I think, key. Uh, that has to be addressed. That is an issue that has to be, has to be, to be met head on by the 
uh, sorry to the to the new financial uh, finance secretary. I think that is an issue that the new finance secretary would have to address head on, as in what to do with this unspoken thing. Okay, number one. Number uh, two is uh, the fiscal consolidation package that was recently circulated. I guess it's it's really the same package as the previous DOF. Uh, meaning uh, the Duterte government DOF. So it's basically the same package being uh, being extended, uh, hoping uh, that this would also be passed. So yeah, so my sense is that since we do need to spend for recovery, um, we have uh, we have to be more Catholic than the Pope, so to speak, meaning whatever we do from this day forward has to be, you know, uh, really transparent. OK, so whatever spending has to be really transparent so that market sentiment will not move uh, negatively uh, against us as a country. OK, so that's why you have need. That's why there's, we always say you need to have a solid fiscal consolidation program. It's a consolidation program that the market has to buy into. It has to believe that while they are spending, we know they can pay for it because they are doing this. Okay. So I hope that uh, answers uh, the question. Yeah. Thank you very much, Maggie. So I'm reviewing our, um, our chat box and um, OK, I think all uh, the questions have been covered. So at this point, I think she clarified uh, we, it to resistance to tax resistance measures. To tax measures. Yeah, you're yeah. right. Because we're coming out of a pandemic, and then you're going to, to, uh, to raise taxes. The usual yes. answer there is, since there's a new leadership coming in, mm -hmm. they would have to use their political, uh, you know, capital because mm -hmm. it's supposed to be a super majority, as Congressman Salceda calls it. So. Uh, yeah, we look to our leadership to somehow be able to uh, present a package that is acceptable to right. the citizens mm -hmm. of the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's hope for the best then. <laughs> okay, uh, so at this point, uh, we are closing uh, the open uh, forum and to cap our discussion, we ask each speaker for their final words. Uh, Starting, starting with uh, Dr. Reyes, Mamsel. Thank you, Sheila. Um, what we're hoping from this book project is is really um, um, to instill the need to um, do post disaster assessments, just so that we can learn. Um, you know, we document well what, what we've done and so we can learn from this, uh, from these experiences. And we hope that this particular book project will somehow contribute to that effort. And we're hoping that um, since we did it, uh, you know, just one year um, into the pandemic and um, the pandemic hasn't really ended, we hope that this effort will be continued so that we can document um, more comprehensively um, the responses as well as the impacts of all these responses. So um, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Reyes. And um, may we hear from Val? Yeah, I agree with, 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 with um, Mamsel. So I, I hope this book will serve as a like, uh, will initiate post-mortem analysis of what happened. Um, during the pandemic, especially in the health sector, we we tend to forget a lot of things in the past. So I think it's important for us to to use um, to, to 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 reflect and to step back what happened, and we use that to move forward. So I think this will this book will be a, will be a good start to do that. So thank you very much, Dr. Ulet and uh, Dr. Devoke Gonzalez. Please, uh, your final words. Yeah, yeah, all the same as Dr. Zell. I hope we learned the lessons that uh, uh, we learned from this pandemic. And then given the state of our economy now, I, I don't like, I don't, I'm not really that pessimistic. And I hope uh, we can do all the things that are needed to bring our debt down and to bring our country back to a, a path of economic recovery, upward, Slope. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> Thank you very much, Maggie. Of course, uh, doc, uh, Dr. Orbeta, sir, please, your final words. Uh, I think I have just two statements. One is that uh, we should recognize uh, that they, we had have learning issues even before the pandemic. And the pandemic exacerbated these learning issues uh, because we have to do we have to rely on remote learning. And uh, on top of that is this deterioration in the uh, in the disparity in learning across income classes. So that's those are I think the major uh, not easy to solve, but uh, recognizing the problem is the first step to solving to finding a solution. Thank. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, friends, so please join me in thanking our presenters, of course, our volume editor, Dr. Celia Reyes, uh, and the chapter, uh, some of the chapter authors, uh, Dr. Aniceto Beta Jr., Dr. Maggie De Buque Gonzalez, and Dr. Val Ulip. Let's give all of them a big virtual clap. Okay, and before we uh, finally close, I would like to announce the winners of our. Uh, of um, our draw for for today or um, i mean those who who uh, participated in our open forum we have the following joshua felicita magsumbol karen may tablin florencio jr mongoso and uh rochelle sita banhige so we will um send you a copy of uh uh the book uh, once it, it is off the press and our webinar team will also get in touch with you um, for the delivery of your prize okay and finally we have some reminders so you may get copies of the presentations from the pids website so uh, just uh, go to uh, pids.gov.ph and we encourage everyone to download um, the e-copy e of the book, no, which is which you can also access from our website. It is uh, free of charge. You can download as many copies of you as you want. Okay, and also we have um, a reminder to always um, answer the feedback survey, which will pop on your screen um, once we end this webinar. So please help us improve our webinars by answering the survey. Our um, your feedback is important to us to improve our virtual events. And uh, please uh, continue to follow our social media pages. Also visit our website for um, all our knowledge products and events. And our we have a YouTube channel where you can access all the recordings of our webinars even before the pandemic, okay? And we have the following webinars next month. Um, in okay, on June 9, we will have a webinar which will tackle the oil price stabilization fund. This is in response to calls uh, regarding uh, the revival of the fund. So our uh, presenter, uh, the author of the paper, Dr. Adorasho Navarro, will tell us the risks and alternatives to reviving the OPSF. And on June 16, we will have a webinar about uh, the um, AFMA, the Agri um, Agricultural, uh, Agriculture and Fisheries Moder Modernization Act. Um, Dr. Um, Ruel Briones will tell us about uh, modernizing the Philippines agriculture and fisheries sector. And on June 23, we will have a, another webinar, but this time it's on health, assessing the readiness of Philippine hospitals to provide high quality health care. And this will be led, uh, this webinar will be uh, presented uh, uh, by uh, the team of uh, Dr. Val Ulep. Okay. And finally, we would like to thank all the uh, representatives from uh, the different sectors, from the government, from civil society, from academe, uh, and from the private sector who joined us today. Um, hope you can um, join our uh, forthcoming um, webinars. So this concludes the launch of the PIDS book, The Philippines Response to the COVID-19 Pandemic, Learning from Experience and Emerging Stronger to Future Shocks. Thank you, and we look forward to your 
participation in our uh, forthcoming events. Maraming salamat po.